Norton Planning Board, Tuesday, June 18th, to order. Um, I think it's best if we, we skip over the uh, bills of warrants and the, and the planning business um, because we need to move into executive session to, uh, to discuss the strategy with respect to the litigation regarding Nexon Energy versus uh, the planning board. Um, the votes will be taken, may be taken during the executive session and afterwards the board will return to open session. Uh, I'd need a, oh. Mr. Chairman, uh, as an abutter to that project, I'll recuse myself from that session. Okay. So I'll need a motion and a second. We'll do a roll call vote. Move to go to executive session. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Julie. Yes. Um, Scott is recused, so Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Oren. Yes. Tim. Yes. And I will vote yes. And you will be returning to open session? Yeah, we will be returning to open session. And we're moving to a conference room because of the openness of this room. Okay. Uh, due to the openness of this room, we're, we're going to be moving to the conference room for executive session, and we will return shortly thereafter. We'll call the regular planning board meeting back to order. Um, We'll still hold off on the planning board business. So we can get to the ANR. We have an ANR endorsement for 301 South Worcester Street. The owner. Now you can come up and state your name. Yeah, uh, Craig Sigodowski, Rim Engineering. The owner is uh, Marsha uh, Godfrey, but she's in her 90s and couldn't be here tonight. Just has uh, about. 30 and a half acres of land between South Worcester, Dean, John Scott Boulevard, and we're breaking out one 60,000 square foot lot. <clears throat> no wetlands on this piece of land, no existing buildings on the lot that we're creating. The existing buildings that are shown will stay as they are. Questions from the board? Just, uh, it's probably simple. Uh, you're just creating lot two? Correct. Lot one is the remainder of her property. Yeah. And one more part, this is all upland? <clears throat> 60,000, the entire lot two is upland. It meets the the frontage requirements, and uh, it's our sixty right, well, sixty thousand square foot lot that he's created. Right. If there are, yeah, if there aren't any questions, I can entertain a motion to endorse. So moved. We have Second. a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Let's have it. Three? Yeah, I think we should sign all. We've got one here that started. We'll do that one. Yeah. This is why I stole from the Go ahead, Joe. You can start it off again. <laughs> Next up, we have the public hearing. Um, a special permit 487. Let's see. Edith Reed Conservation Land. Um, who? I'm sorry. 
Jennifer Carlin. I apologize. That's okay. If Jennifer Carlin is here to speak. Whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Um, so we had just gone to town meeting to allow camping on property in town. So we have a special permit before you to allow camping on conservation and um, selectman property. So selectman property is on forest and one of the islands in the reservoir where people usually camp. And then the conservation property is the Edith Reed Conservation Land, Johnson Acres off North Washington Street, Rose Farm, um, and that's it. So those properties, we only requested a special permit for the properties where scouts or, or people have already been camping. It's not opening any new camping areas, so it's in established places already. Um, there were some questions or a lot of concern about the fire pits. Um, when we talked about the zoning change and so I've met with the abutters um, twice at Edith Reed conservation property and the with the fire de um, department as well and we went over some um, adjustments to where the fire pits are located and today we just met with um, Aaron Wittenden the Bristol County forestry warden and he gave us some more um, pointers on where to put the fire pits and um, we'll be working with a deputy at the fire department to come up with um, uh, just a process for, for people to be able to follow and um, to make sure that there's um, everybody watching the fire while it's there. Um, a bucket of water has to be with you, obviously only adults. Um, and everyone will still follow the same process where they'll fill out the camping application form through me, through the conservation office. So I have all contact information and know who's responsible for the property. Um, and then they have to notify police and fire if they're going to be on any of the Do we have any questions from the board? Do any of the plans identify where these fire pits are going to be? I think the Edith Reed Edith plan Reed, yeah. had have them marked where there are currently fire pits. And the only other place where there is an actual fire pit is Johnson Acres, and that is... Um, it's actually a, a cooking grill type setup in there. Is in there the, just one in the picnic those? area? There's like two within a stone wall. Okay. Yeah. And how many are at either Edith Reed, Jen? Right now, it looks like there are three. Uh, when we spoke with the fire, uh, the forestry warden, um, it was suggested that we actually, instead of using the large um, uh, concrete um, cinder block area that's there now will shrink it down to and buy actual fire rings uh -huh. and so those will be shrunken down to about three feet wide um, and there would be uh, four of them four, okay will there be any other abandoned ones on the lots like that were existing that won't uh there's the back field at edith reed where there are camping platforms we're not intending to put have camping in that area <laughs> right now just so we can get things going in the front portion and make sure everything is working properly and then if we do um, allow camping in the back section where the tent platforms are already uh, we may have to amend our special permit to add there's already there's the cinder block fire pit but we wouldn't keep that we would go with the um, forestry wardens recommend and the fire department's recommendations on changing them to the actual uh, metal fire ring and then there aren't any on the Reservoir Islands, Rose Farm, or the Town Forest? Correct. Okay, so zero on those. Correct. Is, um, is there an uh, um, itemization of how many camping spots with or without fire pits mm. per parcel? Mm. Have, you, have you got limits? In other words, there's a limit of five on either three, three on Johnson, or is, what, uh, what is it you're applying for in terms of numbers of campsites? 
Johnson Acres is uh, two open fields, and so people have always just used the two fields. So I guess we would call that the, the two campsites at Johnson Acres. I don't. Edith but Reed has tent platforms. There are ten of them. But as part of this, are you are you? Um, um, I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm, sorry. You, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but um, is there a way to is there an you're booked up? Is, is there a number is? of of campsites that you're going to limit uh, these properties to? I mean, if, if 200 people decide they're going to go to Edith Reed. Oh yeah, no. It, um, just the six campsites in the front near the lodge would be available All right, so at any time. Okay, at Edith Reed, just those six? So Correct. if Edith Reed is six, I, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get okay. to is, are there limits in terms of sheer numbers that you're going to assign to these properties? Um, Has that been determined yet? It hasn't been determined yet. I've never had more than one person want to camp on the property at a time so far, so it hadn't really come up. But the, there are six um, different tent platforms where people could camp at Edith Reed. Otherwise, the other properties, people are just bringing their tents and camping in one location. So it's really one campsite but for I, all the other properties. What I'm trying to get a sense for in terms of the special permit, mm -hmm. are we going to put limits on the number of, of campsites permitted as part of this? Do you have that already internally that we don't know about? I mean, if, again, Rose Farm, take, take any of them. If, if 20 people decide that they're going to all get together and go to Rose Farm, um, we don't know that as the planning board. You may know it as, as the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Conservation Commission, but if we get complaints that there are you know, 30 people that, out there, are, are there any limitations? Or do we put the limitations on in absence of limitations? Number of people. Um. Jennifer, I would are you trying to equate it to like an occupancy permit? I mean, an, occup well, kinda, an occupancy yeah, number? Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? Well, you know, if you've got 20 acres and zoning is an acre mm -hmm. a lot, then you know the limit is 20. If we just approved a subdivision of 20 acres and someone said, well, I'm going to build 150 houses, we've got, there's no, again, you may know it and, and it just hasn't been communicated to us, but given the fact that we've asked, that we're going through a special permit process, I'm just trying to get a sense of what do we tell neighbors? You don't have to worry that there won't be you know, 200 people showing up on a, on a weekend for a college reunion. <coughs> I don't want to speak for you, but I would think that y you have the paperwork and the permit that you would um, right. provide to, to any applicants, right? So you would manage that your own, you know, internally through the, as a conservation agent. Uh, well, you know, we, have we certainly have in the past. Uh, well, the application form now asks for the number of people and the number of cars and where they might be parking. But well, that's per permit. Per permit. And I guess what I'm asking for is... You want to know about the property. What, what's the maximum per... Uh, facility maximum number of permits that would be issued at any one time maximum number of permits, permits for one property for the same date right, right. now is one I'm sorry is one but you just said either three has six uh, six so uh, you would only allow one permit but that person person might bring six tents right So it's, it's always been a scout group, so they've always been friends. I haven't had to worry about whether people are camping next to each other and know each other and if we should allow more than one group at a time. So it hasn't come up yet, but it's certainly a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, again, not that I, I'm suggesting yeah. what the limit should be, but yeah. and you know, using the past where, in essence, it was illegal, uh, is probably not a good forecaster for what uh -huh. uh, this might become very popular. I, I, I'm just, I, I think abutters have a right to know yep. that, you know, the worst that we, we can expect here is five campers, or whatever the number is, as opposed to open-ended. 
um, I can certainly try to put that together for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Joe's saying, and then the fact with the fire pits too, Jen, I know when, when we were talking about the town mm -hmm. meeting, we, we would want to make sure that that's part of the application, and then we don't permit anybody other than, let's say, if there's only one fire pit, one camping group with a fire pit, right, right to, to address some of those issues. So yep. I think as, let's say, it's kind of changed a little bit, it's a little bit more of a formal process, right, than it has been in the past, and, and um, you know, hopefully some of this is making people more aware that there is camping at these locations that you might so see some more interest. Yeah. So it might be good to, yep. to Joe's point, just maybe set some minimums or maximums that, that you feel comfortable with on the property. Cause we'd hate to have somebody go out there to Joe's point and bring all these people. And then, you know, God forbid they did something destructive and then how are we going to, you know, fix that so yeah. to speak in the future. I mean, it's, but it is, it's the exact same process. Um, yeah. You're only exactly permitting one but I've group. never seen the, a permit come through and so there be so many people on there. I look at it and go, you can't possibly have that many people there. Um, mm -hmm. But I can, I can try to put something more concrete together for you. Yeah, and again, I'm not some, because I, I think it really becomes difficult. Do we approve a group of 10 or, uh, but not a group of 12? I, I'm, I'm more concerned with how many different permits per parcel are going to be issued. I'm less concerned that there are 12 mm -hmm. people that are all somehow interconnected and they was one permit than yeah. 12 separate permits where, you know, these people don't know one another and, you know, there may be some conflict. I'm just trying to get a sense. My assumption was there's one permit, one piece of property for one date at a time. So you don't intend to do more than one permit per property? So does that, does that help you? No. But I think the idea is to, Joe, I don't want to speak for you, but the idea is to put some framework in place yeah. that would be kind of something to score or gauge against in the future if there is any issues or problems in the future, or at least have a document. And perhaps give you some flexibility. So if it's a big enough site and it can sustain two different campsites at the same time, you know, rather than coming back each time to try to change that. No, I can uh, try to give you, I can give you something more concrete before your next meeting three, if you want. Kind of, that would kind of lend itself to almost two separate groups in theory. And well, if it yeah. does grow in popularity, you know, there may then at least be something to Hey, we know we have a limitation of 50 people or 10 people, whatever it is. Yep. Yeah, and the E to 3, if you have the six tent sites, you might have two groups that want to do it the same night. So we don't want to limit you, but also, yeah, you don't want to see five different permits out yeah, there. Yeah, like you might know if there's six tent sites and the Boy Scouts come, they're going to use all six. But let's say a family comes and they're only going to have two, then you could actually afford to have another family camp that same night if you felt that was appropriate and still each could have a fire pit at the same time mm -hmm. too. So we could afford potentially, you know, more people to access the site over the course of a weekend. Okay. Do we have any further questions from the board? This is a, it may have been something I mentioned previously, but in terms of the notification process for police and fire, I think I would be more comfortable if the burden was not on the applicant to, if the notification process was a little less disconnected from like the initial application so that they apply to you, they say, oh yeah, I'm going to go talk to the fire now and then they look at their phone, forget they were going to do that and then go away and the fire department was never notified. So just finding a way to integrate that more into the application itself in terms of whether that is whenever an application comes in that you forward along to them automatically okay. or you, you tell the applicant I'm going to send this to fire and police so they will have your information and they will come out and they will to put it nicely come after you if yep. they have any questions but that's easy enough for me to do it's just a, yeah. a copy just to, to somebody um, coming from a non trust we can certainly do that and then uh, <laughs> from a cynical I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long it would take, but with our new online pro permitting process, then that would that be, would yeah. might be another option. Yeah. But we're still with um, just building and board of health uh, and fire department is just starting to get their permits online. Mm. Um, yeah. So if there's an opportunity to put the camping permit online, then police and fire would automatically be notified right away. So, but in the meantime, I can certainly make the copy or forward it to them. Yeah, just yeah. to, yeah. It's, it's nice for them to meet with the fire department, but also, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And if, if you're going to put the numbers together about how many potential groups or, or permits for each site, um, it would be good to also note how many people in a group um, that, that would be too many. Um, so if you have a group of 50 applying for one permit, you don't, you're probably not going to approve that. Um, that, that you might want to include that as well. Again, likely we won't be dealing with that, but in the event that you do, it's, it's good to have that in place. Um, okay. Okay, do we have anything further on, from the board here? Just, uh, do you have people? And we're not meeting again until the uh, 16th of July. And if you, I mean, I, I don't want to hold people up from using this. I'm just trying to see if there's a way we can give a conditional special permit. I don't know. Do you have people? I don't have anybody lined up just yet. Um, and the students from Southeast Regional Vocational Technical School just finished last week doing some carpentry and plumbing work for us. And we're still cleaning the lodge itself. Um, so it my capital improvement money doesn't come in until July 1 anyway, just for replacing the refrigerator and the stove. Um, so a, a mid-July time frame is certainly not unreasonable. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we still need to hear from from any anyone in the audience too. Um, so you wouldn't be opposed to having it continue to the next meeting. Before that, anything else from the board? No? Okay. Are there any, anyone in the audience that would like to come up and ask questions or speak? No? <coughs> Just state your Hi. name and your address. Yes, Sue Tamil, 5 Anna Away. So I just have a couple of questions about, because um, it's a little unclear to me, um, how you'll monitor the numbers, like after, so people will come here to the town hall to check in or get a permit or something like that. Is that right? Or the, can I? Not gonna come here to check in so, oh, what there. we'll do. Like, is there yeah. gonna be someone on site monitoring who, who goes in and who checks in and how many and I guess that would be a question I would have for a lot of things um, also regarding like noise and regarding uh, campfire and fire safety on site whether there would be um, you know whether there would be someone monitoring that in the area and uh, trash removal, um, bathrooms, things like that. Is there going to be someone on site monitoring this stuff? So that would be my main question. Um, so what I'll, I'll do, I apologize. I should have said that beforehand. You, you'll yeah. ask the questions and then we'll have her come up and. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. So you can I'm get just not sure exactly how it no, goes. OK. That's fine. And then um, I guess uh, living on the in a way, I was just curi curious if there was going to be any kind of a uh, physical barrier to keep people from like wandering into the neighborhoods or anything like that from the sites and I think that's about it so thank you thank you and just just to confirm as well and uh, any of these sites these sites have already been used correct people have been camping there for the 20 years that I've been working here uh, no, there is no funding for a caretaker. That was mentioned at town meeting and at the planning board meeting before that. Uh, fire, we've already discussed. Noise would go to the police department. Trash, it is a leave no trace facility. People will need to remove the materials that they bring in with them. And that is um, why I have their contact information. And if they don't comply with that, then there would be uh, some, some, some sort of fine. Are those rules? Uh posted somewhere they will be yeah I mean conservation property rules are posted on our property right now they're on our website um, it's part of that conservation land pamphlet that I gave you um, but they'll it will be posted 
And is that passed out to someone who's, let's say, a first-time camper who uses the facility? You educate them on the rules of, you know, take the trash with you, those those type of things? Yeah, I mean, it'll all be written, and it's Good. it's on the kiosks when you first pull up. Um, for some of the properties, we're ordering new signs um, at the end of the fiscal year since I have a little money left over. Uh, yeah. Do we have any further questions from... And I think one audience. last question that wasn't answered maybe is, uh, are the property boundaries marked just so if people are wandering around, they know kind of where the limitations are? Is there any sign? The campsite, the campsite areas that are designated for, for camping aren't um, so close to any of the abutting properties that they would be wandering through the woods for like that or, or through that trail. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the audience that would like to come up? Hi. All right, Stanford 73 North Worcester. I about the Girl Scout camp. And <clears throat> you may recall that I wrote you a letter when it came to the bylaw allowing camping. And I was opposed to allowing citizens out there without training in fire safety. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, great, but not citizens. We've come to learn that that's not going to happen. So we're doing all we can to make it as safe as possible for everybody that's going to go out there. Uh, your point on the permitting process, I, I agree 100% in that maybe they should have an application to fill out, then take that to the police, take it to fire, bring it back to Jennifer, to her all completed, and then maybe get some kind of a list of rules from her as to what they have to do. I'd like to see something like that in place on the permit. Um, also, Jennifer mentioned it's strictly tent camping out there. I'd like that included somehow so that we don't end up with the Winnebago or pop-up tent campers or anything with wheels out there. I'd like to keep it to tent camping. I think that'll keep the traffic down to a certain extent. It's a beautiful site. If you haven't seen it, you should take a walk out there. I think when it opens and becomes usable, you're going to find a, a high demand for this. And it's something I think the town is going to have to grow with. This is, as evidenced by the meeting tonight, there's just so many questions we don't have answers for yet out there. So when you do, and I'm, I'm sure you will issue a permit for this, I'd like to make it <clears throat> annually renewable so that we learn what we do through the next year and then have an opportunity to come back here in the spring and say, okay, this works, this doesn't work, we really should change this somehow. I'd like to have something in place that gives us that opportunity. Because it, it's going to be quite a thing out there. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I understand the... Uh, the desire to have this annually renewed or reviewed, mm -hmm. but better or worse, a special permit runs forever. And I think, um, you know, keeping that in mind, maybe what we do is, is keep it somewhat restrictive now. It can be expanded later upon review, but whatever we agree to today, um, that's it. So it's not something you can do annually? No. From a process standpoint, no. Uh, so is, what would you have to do annually? Just remove it? Revoke I mean, it? If, if, for example, um, <coughs> town meeting allowed for the uh, camping with a special permit from the planning board. Mm -hmm. So if we issue a, plan, a, a, a special permit um, tonight or the next time we meet and we restrict it to a just tent camping, for example, then nothing else can... Yeah, you, you can't have a, a Winnebago or, or mm -hmm. unless at some point in time that's a desired uh, use and the special permit is amended and the process kind of starts all over again. Okay. But it, it, so I guess the only way to accomplish what you're looking for is to be somewhat restrictive this go around. And if there's a need for an expansion, then the special permit can be uh, reviewed and mm -hmm. expanded. But it can't. We can't put a life on it. Special permit. But it could be amended, I guess, is what you're saying. It can be amended okay. uh, going forward, yes. 
what would that process be? Could it would it would be a, a either if it's what's called a, a minor modification, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to think um, if we allowed. Let's say, for example, we we just allowed the pup tents, um, and uh, someone said, well. That only handles up to three people. Uh, we'd like to see six. Well, that's a minor modification. We wouldn't have to go through the whole public hearing process. Mm -hmm. If we, if someone said, you know, we, I just bought this uh, brand new RV and I'd like to drive down there and use it. If we only allowed tents, then that would require. That's a major modification. You'd have to, no, you know, notify abutters all over again and um, go through that hearing process. But it's not one of these things that you, know, you can. Say well, let's try this for six months and then come back and look at it. Well, we mm -hmm. can come back and look at it, but it has no legal bearing on the special permit that was issued. And that's also why it's important to know the number of, of permits we're going to provide per site, because right now, if we issued one per site and then she, you know, comes back and you, you get a lot of demand for it, then she'd have to come back, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a major adjustment as well. Yeah. So, All right. well, I can just see it's going to be a growing process. Out yeah. There. It's, yeah, so, so we start start more conservatively, and then. But it is amendable, is what you're saying to me. It is amendable, um, and there's a process for that. Okay. To happen. Yeah. I would say that there's a level of procedures that's probably outside of the special permit that is something that I think Jennifer is going to be very on top of in her role with, in all of this, mm -hmm. and I think that um, certainly as somebody who's right next to the camp and if you are seeing something that is not in keeping with the spirit of the property I'm sure that Jennifer will be happy to hear what you Oh think. I'm sure she would she's been helpful yeah. through this yeah. but she's so one person she's the one yeah. man show yeah. and one of the questions one woman show. Was, was on a caretaker and that's I mean that's nothing that we can add uh, No I understand so. that I understand that now I think you are right. I think as, as the camp is being improved and, and Jennifer and uh, has, has invested a lot and the town has that I, I think some of these little treasures will, will become more popular. And, oh, yeah. and I think to Joe's point, I think that, you know, working together and having this dialogue now and, and having Jen think about how many people can be serviced at each site or how many sites there are so that we permit it correctly now. And then we can, we are, we are going to have to learn and grow, I think with the process, but I think we can hopefully take the appropriate steps towards that um, to protect the neighborhood, protect the site and the investments that we're making into these sites and the improvements, you know, even getting fire rings, Jen, I mean, that would be, I'm sure, amazing. That'd be great improvements to, to the safety and security of, of operating a fire on those sites. Mm -hmm. So that's great to hear. Um, and we we'll want to make sure that, that those investments are made and, and maintained and not, you know, hopefully destroyed in any way. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else from the audience who'd like to speak? I'm going to go hiking at some of these places. <laughs> Hi, Ellen Valentine, 71 North Worcester Street. Um, you've seen me here before, and I also spoke at town meeting about the neighborhood concern, um, not just the immediate neighborhood of Camp Edith Reed, but also, um, as we had tonight, some residents of Anna Way and all of the abutting areas off of Walker Street, Oak Street, Shelley Road. Um, people who are would be directly affected if a fire got out of hand. Um, I went to view the fire pits with Jennifer and some of the neighbors, and um, there are 10 platforms there, and there's going to be four fire pits. So when you say there'll be one permit, Jennifer, for each campsite, does that mean that that one group might use six platforms because they have that many people? Then why would they need four fire pits if you are just having one group there per campground? So, so what you can do is have your comments, address them to the board, and, and oh, okay. we'll have her come up. Okay, the other thing is, um, at Rose Farm, there are no fire pits, and they're allowing camping there. Um, there have been fires out there, a lot of um, kids out there drinking, there's a lot of trash been left, um, and fires were built um, in the wood, woods and the fields. <gasps> Not permitted fires, these were just kids going out there and raising a ruckus, and um, you can ask a lot of the abutters, they, they've been aware of this over the years. So um, will um, fires be allowed on Rose Farm without fire pits um, in what designated areas? Um, 
the other thing is there are other platforms further back in the back of the, um, which is closer to the Anna Way area, um, with no monitoring. If someone makes a permit online, and even if the fire and the police know about this camping um, party, um, how are we going to know that they are taking the trash out? How are we going to know that they're going to stay in the designating camping area and not go to the rear and decide to build a fire with just a small area of rocks and let's build a fire? There's no one to keep tra track of this. There's no one to keep track the next day to clean the bathrooms, to make sure the kitchen's clean. I'd like to get the Board of Health's opinion about this. Um, who's going to monitor the health standards for the bathroom, the kitchen? Um, I also think that's essential before we go into this that we would have some kind of a field agent and a salary for that. So I spoke with Heather Graff. She and I are willing to work with Jennifer to um, put an article on the town meeting warrant in the fall to ask for a budgetary allotment for someone who would do this to ensure the safety of this property and all the abutters and the town. We all know what can happen when a wildfire gets out of control, as in California, it happened a lot. Um, and just for public safety, um, there needs to be some monitoring. So I would ask that, don't just put this off until July, put it off until after the, the town meeting so we can see if we can get some money. She doesn't even have a full-time secretary. Um, she cannot possibly clean the bathrooms herself with her workload. And um, the kitchen, obviously, if it's being used, there's health standards there. So I would ask you that you vote to put this off indefinitely until we can get a proper monitoring system for this property. Um, I'd like an answer about the Rose Farm and I believe Johnson Acres. Where are people going to camp and where are they going to build fires? Thank you. Thank you. Jen, do you want to address? Um, thank you for offering to help put more money in my budget so I can do more things. Like, like you said, I only have a part-time secretary. I did a, ask for a full-time secretary. Um, that didn't happen. We'll try again in the fall, but would be happy to add uh, funding for a caretaker at that time, so thank you. Uh, if that's put off until October, then that's another full season with no camping. Um, and the property was purchased to allow camping. So I would ask that you continue to the next meeting, but please make a decision then. Uh, as far as I know, Board of Health is not required to be involved. If there's any, cam if there's any cooking at the lodge, it's for themselves and it is not for sale. Um, but that's an easy enough thing for me to go and check with the Board of Health again. It's never been brought up before, but I can certainly ask a more pointed question to them. Uh, if anyone's tried to cook dinner on a campfire, um, one fire pit that's, you know, 36 inches isn't going to be large enough to feed six people all at the same time. So it it does require more than one 36-inch uh, fire pit in order to have everybody have dinner. So um, when we met with the fire warden, uh, the forestry warden, um, and the fire department today, they did say that, yes, three to four fire pits of that size, the reduced size from what's there now, is appropriate for the number of tent platforms that are on the property in the front portion. The rear portion, uh, where there are tent platforms, we're not intending to allow camping in that location at this time. Um, and people, there will have to be a system of um, uh, meeting with people uh, or doing the site inspection when people leave to make sure that there is no uh, damage to the property, that they weren't doing things improperly. Um, but that would have to be after after they've, they've camped there to do that double check. Um, and yeah, right now I am the one cleaning the bathrooms, but the, I don't have a budget for it, so it'll be me for a while. Um, and that's just what you have to work with. So. Um, the other question was the uh, Rose at Rose Farm. Rose uh, Farm, yeah. It's 
the, um, the Boy Scouts had always been the ones camping there. Um, and did they camp without a campfire? Uh, that that I'm not sure, of, but there's never been a designated fire pit area. Right. And as far as I know, the whole field is is full of poison ivy, and they haven't been there in several years. Um, so I just put down the properties where I know people had camped in the past. If that means we have to work out um, a way to have the field mowed, if they want to go back there, um, and then designate the camps, the the one fire or the fire pit. Um, that certainly makes sense. So it wouldn't be used until the fire pit was put in? Correct, yeah. 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 Just to restate, if there is no fire ring, then there could be no fires at that site, basically. Is Correct. Right now, there's no fire ring. They shouldn't have fires at the site. Yeah. And, and would that be posted on the signage or, or ground rules? I think, I think it may be helpful to yep. at least see a draft of you know, the designated areas, number of pits or not, what limitations there may be on vehicles, people, sites. Just whatever your recommendation would be great to see a first pass of that. And okay. I'm sure there's a lot of great stuff at other campsites that you could leverage. So. Yeah, and I, mean, uh, yeah, I take pictures of yeah. really good ones when I'm out camping. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> I had to take a picture of this. <laughs> and Paul, you said that this already had been sent to the Board of Health, correct? For their review. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. They have, they have, they've seen it. Yeah. And Jen's worked with, with them extensively. Thank you, Jen. Do we, do we have anyone else in the audience that would like to come up? Okay. Hearing none, um, the chair will entertain a motion to continue this to the 16th, July. So moved. Second. Okay. The motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's continued until the 16th. We have a discussion on the Norton Village Center plan. Yeah, we have, do we um, have? With Nate Kelly with, uh, with Horsley Witten, who's been uh, uh, project manager for this. And uh, we see Mr. Kimball, who's been an active stakeholder member. But uh, Nate is going to give you a presentation on the report. Um, Nate, I just need to put this, get this back on. Good evening, everyone. I know I'm not supposed to be looking at my phone, but for your benefit, I checked the Red Sox score. It's one to one, bottom of the fourth. <laughs> We're seeing how our technology works. Looking good so far, Paul. Wow. In the future. Nate, you must be bringing good luck to us. Uh, I have it on the fly. Can you put this for the changer? Will that work? Oh, sure. Thanks. Right there, yeah. just turn oh, so I can see it a little bit. Oh, yeah. All right. Outstanding. So I'll just run through this presentation fairly quickly. This, um, I think this, you know, just for the sort of stepping back, I think this project represents, you know, not sort of a gigantic milestone, and um, but it is a milestone in a sense. I think in planning for the village center, you'll see that we took on basically two big issues with this report and did a considerable amount of outreach and um, some thinking about next steps and I think really laid the platform uh, for both some short-term and some long-term implementation, both of which uh, will be significant to the plan. Um, so, you know, our goals for this project, we wanted to look at transportation options um, for the center, improve the look of the area, create that sense of place that it already has, but build upon that, the historic sort of traditional New England town center. 
Um, think about future development patterns and investments and how that's going to be leveraged. Obviously, I think you're all aware, for example, that there is critical infrastructure um, going into this area, both in the form of you know sidewalks and, and bike lanes, but also uh, sewer capacity. So that really kind of changes the game in terms of looking at future investment. It's a major uh, impediment to uh, future development, so we want to sort of get ahead of that uh, with this report by setting a clear vision. Um, and our action agenda. So with our focus area, you know, we really looked at sort of, we, we, when we start with this as planners, we think, okay, um, our goal here is to think about people on foot. Um, primarily because that those are the folks that are going to have the toughest time getting around and they're going to have the most limited scope. So we look at the quarter mile and the half mile radius. I think that that's about as far as somebody's going to want to walk to get from point A to point B um, once they're in Library Square. So where's that reach um, for pedestrians um, and, you know, thinking about those sort of critical areas. And what we did beginning a year ago, so we're a year into this process, we just started out basically with issues and opportunities and thinking about, you know, what are the assets that you have here? And it really is for such a small kind of, you know, tidy little uh, New England center, there's a lot going on here. Uh, it doesn't take long, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but as outsiders, you know, we spent a little time looking around the center and said there really is a lot of activity. And we're just thinking about concepts. So we think about the transportation concepts, how things might change moving forward, uh, building upon some of the improvements that we know are going to take place, and how might development patterns change moving forward, and what is happening with today's regulations, and you know why aren't certain things happening that maybe were intended to happen, and what's the sort of the assessment on those issues. And then around September, so we were just a few months into this, um, we were thinking about what should move forward. And this was, you know, um, primarily in terms of the transportation options, which we'll get into. We thought about the road configuration. We know that Norton's been talking about this for a long, long time. Um, but this is the kind of project that takes a long, long time to do. Um, there are a lot of steps to it. Um, in the end, you may not change anything, but in order to answer that question definitively, a lot of work has to be done over a number of years. And so at this point, once we reach March, we came up with our recommendations, which is what we'll get into tonight. So the document, oops, if you've had a chance to see it, um, has a vision statement and goals, uh, sort of the classic planning document. And then it looks at the Library Square intersection. This is sort of that first big uh, issue that we wanted to take on, talk with the public, people who have been working on this for a long time. We had a lot of institutional knowledge. They were able to actually sort of, sort of replay the conversation that the communities had in the past. And we noticed that some things had changed in that community discussion uh, coming up to today. Um, the second sort of big set of issues was the village development, and that really gets down to what's the desired pattern of development that you want in the area? What's the zoning set to do today? Is the zoning doing what it was intended to do? And if not, what can we do to sort of rethink that going forward? And then always looking through the lens of walking and biking and transit, thinking about what Gatra's plans are. Uh, we don't know all their plans for this area, but we do know that they want to put a bus hub in the area. We don't know where at this point. Those are ongoing discussions. Um, so there, again, there's sort of a synergy um, coming together on the transit part as well that I think is just going to strengthen things as we continue to go forward. So looking at Library Square intersection, um, what we just did was we developed a series of scenarios, and some of these scenarios um, do reflect scenarios that have been discussed in the past, but we want to sort of bring some of these forward, some new ideas, as well as, you know, dusting off some old ideas. And there's always the no change scenario. And we all know the issues that you face today in terms of peak traffic volumes, in terms of uh, who, who is strong enough and fast enough and fit enough to get across the street safely, um, depending on what time of day it is, who's brave enough to bike through that area. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges in terms of moving large volumes of cars through this area because this really is a major through intersection for commuters at peak times. Um, and there's also, um, you know, issues with traffic speeds. When there's not a lot of traffic, people moving through here uh, very quickly. 
Um, but this is always an option to think about. So this is on the table. And you'll see up in the corner, um, we tried to set up sort of a list of uh, emojis um, for people to be able to look at the different trade-offs. Because what became apparent very quickly is one of the reasons why you haven't solved this problem already is because there's no perfect solution. Whatever solution this community is going to come up with, even if it's, you know, leave things as they are, there's going to be trade-offs. Some of these trade-offs are going to be more beneficial for motorists. Some of these trade-offs are going to be more beneficial for people on bikes or on foot. Some of these trade-offs are going to be more expensive. Some of these trade-offs are going to have more impacts or less, less impacts to historic resources in the area. So we want to just sort of give people a quick scale to be able to say, all right, where does this fall relative to each issue as we go through? So. This alternative B is shifting Taunton Avenue. So what this does is, here's existing conditions, and you can see Taunton Avenue um, shifts to the west there, and really just aligns um, going north-south there. And that takes that jog out of it. And wherever you know roads align better, um, you are going to get better traffic movement, because you don't have those left turns and all those turning movements happening and people being confused um, you know in terms of how they get through this area what you see on the diagram sort of shaded in yellow um, this is where when you move the road um, these are the areas that may have greater development potential because of that so just sort of getting a look at how this affects the land side of things every time you move a road it has effects on the adjacent land areas uh, but this keeps the green intact. Um, so from a historic perspective, probably less of an impact. Um, certainly challenging to move a road. There's a lot to that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but from a, a vehicular standpoint, this may be the most advantageous uh, scenario that we came up with. Bicyclists and pedestrians are still going to be struggling you know, a little bit to cross the street, and that gets down into the details of crosswalks and timings and all of those things on signals. This alternative C looks to the north. Um, so instead of um, looking south on Taunton, north on Mansfield, and shifting that eastward. Um, so the obvious impact on this when you're looking is that this um, directly disturbs the historic town green. So this would um, cut some of that off on one side, but then allow for more green space on the other. And so instead of having a single pocket of green space, you now have two that connect across the streets. Um, so this, again, has some of the similar impacts in terms of uh, maybe a little bit more on the historic resource side, uh, probably a, a little bit better for motorists because the alignment and some of the cha same challenges um, for the uh, pedestrian. Uh, but it did have, I think, more appeal to folks who looked at this in terms of our public process just because of the net amount of green space that you had and you actually had access to it in two spots without being interrupted by a road. So pedestrians now could just sort of naturally use the green space instead of trying to hustle across the street to get there and then hustle back once they're done enjoying that particular area. Oops. And then finally, probably our most ambitious uh, sort of out of the box um, is what we came to uh, call the pinwheel concept. Um, so this is a concept that uh, increased accessibility to the green space, added a little green space, um, and definitely was the most advantageous for people on bikes and people on uh, foot. The reason it's most advantageous to them is because it's the least advantageous to the motorists. So the motorists are now doing the work. They're really taking more of the turning. There's more stops. Um, so this is a little bit of work to get through. Uh, for those of you, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's a great comparison, but sort of visually when I first saw this, I thought of that sort of main square in Foxborough. So if you've driven through there and the way that operates, this is sort of a scaled down version of, of what that would look like. So the next steps on this, uh, what we came to in the public process is that based on the level of detail that we were able to do you know, within the resources of this project, we still have a lot of answers to, um, to, to get to. Now when you're permitting this, sort of the, the, the way this aligns well is that if you are going forward and you're going through the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, MEPA, uh, NEPA on the national scale, 
you do have to show that you've tested different options. So we've sort of set the community up nicely to look, you already have your options on the table that you can look at. And what you need to do at this point is to engineer conceptual designs. So these were done by the urban designer on our team. Um, they're not perfectly matched to curb areas. They don't take into account maybe some of the areas of different utilities, the locations of different utilities. So that's sort of the next step is that you look at each one of these, you line up all those areas and say, well, we have a conflict here. Maybe this one falls off. Maybe this one becomes too hard. Maybe this one becomes more advantageous. So you do that engineering. You look at cost estimates associated with that. And then you perform traffic analyses so that you can pair apples to apples, to apples across each one of these scenarios. Um, and get a checklist ready for your permitting. So we have, I think, the scenarios that you would need to enter into this permitting process, and now it's a matter of putting the resources together to get some of this more technical, in the weeds, permitting engineering work done to prepare for looking at those scenarios. Nate, can, can I ask Yes. You? Did you get, so I know we got to vote right on the four. Did you get a split across all of them? Was there one or two that got more votes than the others? It's just curious from just a just general reactionary standpoint. Yeah, this, this was the most popular of the voters. Um, wow. I voted for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, one of the things I should talk about with this process um, is that, and this is totally appropriate, obviously, is that the, the local community and then the state also takes this issue of um, impacts to historic resources very seriously. And this is the one that is most disruptive it is. to the yeah. historic resources. And, you know, my understanding of this is that the state is going to look to the local community, to the, to the folks who deal with permitting and reviewing on historic structures or, or resources, and they're the first sort of stop mm -hmm. on this. So if the community, the local community says, nope, it goes no further, it's, it's, that's it. Um, so in, in my understanding is, is that when discussions of this occurred, you know, years and years ago, that's sort of the attitude, that was, uh, that was the, um, Oh, that sounds negative. That, that was just sort of the opinion was that you know, we're not we're not going to mess with the green. This is important to us. This is a historic resource, and that sentiment, if this process is in any way indicative, seems to be changing a little bit, and people are more open to that. And we had good questions at our last forum, and somebody said we just invested all this money. You know, we just did all this uh, restoration yep. to the green, and I just you know reminded that individual is if you if you went gangbusters you know, into this project now, you probably wouldn't break ground for another 10 to 12 years. Oh, all, easy. With all the permitting and all the things that you have to do. So, you know, there's no issue of sort of wasted money and wasted resources associated with that. Um, but, yeah, this, I mean, I think there, there were folks who voted for all four. Yeah. Um, this one came out ahead. Okay. I liked it because it actually created a usable space of the old library. Mm -hmm. Because in the first working session, I was with somebody from Wheaton, and they said how they can't use that space. Right. at all because there's no parking. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I think when I saw this one, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe then they could actually reuse that old historic building mm -hmm. and create a new use for it because it allows for that, even though yeah. it obviously... So it's, it's an interesting dichotomy of how it negatively impacts some historic significant places or buildings, but might enhance others mm -hmm. to be reused in a, a new way. Yeah, I mean, so when the... It's when an the interesting you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a, there's trade-offs, right? As we always, it, there's always trade-offs. When that historic green was established, um, it was very easy for people to enjoy it. It was very easy for people from, to walk from the church across the street and into the green because there wasn't 20,000 cars whipping by them. And so, you know, that's changed. And I think that that's what resonated with this particular image was that, oh, well, look at that. It's connected right to the sidewalk. I can just... I can just access this green space. So yeah. it's just, yes. In your schedule, you listed that this this uh, alternative was similar to alternative B in terms of traffic. The question I had with with B, my understanding is, uh, in its infinite wisdom, the state has directed all traffic for the Xfinity Center through the center of town, and alter, alternative B at least provided a separate lane that those cars could take a right-hand turn onto 140. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know what the traffic impact of that is. Is that something? Right, and that's and that's this is exactly what this is exactly that that's, next that's step ne is. That's, that's the next step, Warren. Is, <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect see, point. Is like where are the protected I don't know turns? If the traffic flow is this uh, the traffic impact is the same with both the alternatives. Yeah, that would be that would be yeah, part of the next step. Study. Yeah. On all, on all four plans. On all four. All four yeah. plans. So yeah. that's yeah. part of the part of the uh, the the uh, advantage of setting it up this way is that you finally have like we have some traffic data for some of these and not for others. So doing the apples to apples thing has really not been possible. Uh, we did we tried to do some of that with this study, but again we had incomplete data from from different roads and different scenarios. So now that you have these four scenarios, you really have an opportunity to just do all the work for each one and sort of measure that across. So that you could do an accurate comparison across all of them to Oren's point to really fi figure out if that was, yeah. Yeah. there was a benefit. And then to, yeah, new new direction of traffic during special events, right? Mm -hmm. In the, <clears throat> the safety aspect as well, because one, one of the advantages that, that the current layout has <clears throat> is it forces cars uh, to slow down mm. between Taunton Ave and Mansfield mm -hmm. Ave. Yep. Whereas a direct, you know, crossover, I would expect, you know, faster speeds. Yeah, speed would pick up. Yeah, so I was, yep. you know, I had told people as part of this, at the, at the very same time we were doing um, a, an incredibly similar study in the town of Shrewsbury. And if you, I don't know if you've been there or not, but they have a town center that may be a little bit more dense than yours. And they've got that same thing with the, their, their connection has no jog in it. So they've done this. They have, they have this. They have this this configuration here. Where it's a straight shot through both of them, and that was the issue there. Was that you know the first day we showed up, and cars were going through the intersection at 40 miles an hour. Mm. You know it's posted 25, not a prayer. So that was the focus of that particular study. Was how do we sort of manage that? And there are ways to do it. Um, oh, on a bicycle. Is it a road diet, Nate? Part of it. Yeah. 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 I ride uh, my bicycle through there quite often in the summer. I'd rather cut across with all current alternative A mm -hmm. than B or C. Right. Because at least you know that they got to slow it down to make that jog yep. on the road. Yeah, what we talked about in Shrewsbury was not, what was happening is that the first indication of that you had to slow down was a tiny little 25 sign that was about 100 feet outside the center. And so we identified points that were 500, 600 feet back, we're gonna neck down the road mm -hmm. and force drivers to, to, to hit 25 miles an hour, you know, 500 to 1,000 feet out before they come barreling into the, into the so it's really all that speed, speed control. All right, sorry, Nate, we got a little- Not at all. Um, so the next piece was the, the village development. And so, you know, when you're looking at zoning, part of what you do is, you know, you start with what you have. And so, as you are all, I'm sure, are familiar with, um, you have village center zoning in this area. And so, as kind of your outside consultant, we came in and we say, so, okay, so what is this village center doing? How does it work? And one of the first things that struck us um, when you look at the, the zoning map, <laughs> uh, the old zoning map, um, is that the village center zoning is in six different places in the community. And some of these places are really big and sort of encompass a lot of land area with all different kinds of things going on. So you have sort of major corridor, you have some waterfront property, you have small intersections. Um, and, and so I think what if, if I were to sort of try to forensically go back and play these conversations, I think the intent was to create these areas of mixed use development, but because the areas were so diverse, the, the, the zoning kind of got watered down a little bit and it tried to be sort of everything to everybody. So you were allowing golf courses, you're allowing um, auto repair shops, you're allowing boutique and restaurant and all this stuff. So it's really just this huge menu of things that can happen and some design standards that, are, um, that don't have a lot of teeth to them um, because of all the different types of uses that could be in there. So what we uh, recommended in this particular report is, was kind of a conservative first step approach, was looking at these, I'll call them larger parcels um, in, in this area where, this will work on the screen. No. So these are the larger um, 
parcels in the area, you see the post office, library square, that are currently zoned VC. And I, I do think that it is possible to go beyond what we've what we've recommended here, but I think it, it, having done a lot of zoning work, I always, if, if we have an opportunity to kind of start small and see how things go, um, I always recommend doing that. And so we recommended looking at these properties so you see um, right by uh, the elementary school and where you have the large sort of pharmacy uses there. Um, these particular properties would get a new zoning des designation, which would be the village center core. And what would happen here, I mentioned, you know, the sort of cornucopia of uses that are allowed in the village center district now is we would strip that down quite a bit um, because you don't want or need golf courses or cemeteries or auto repair shops or those types of things and really get it down to the sort of vision for that area. So from a residential perspective, you're talking about duplex and multifamily and top of the shop. And these are going to be uses that are going to be, again, a lot easier to deal with once the sewer um, runs down this particular area. And I think it's perfectly appropriate to allow these uses um, by right, um, given some of the design standards that we've incorporated into the recommended zoning. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So again, the VC list, here's just an example, uh, a sample list of things that you know we think wouldn't go into this core area of the village. Um, gas stations, funeral homes, recreational day camp, these are just things that you just you don't need to consider. So let's limit the confusion and, and take those off the list. The dimensional requirements. Um, so some of these we want to adjust the existing standards that you have. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of work in your current zoning bylaw um, that's geared towards um, trying, to con trying to limit density and sort of keep a bit of the rural suburban character that you have um, throughout your community, in the majority of your community. But for this village center core, you know, our recommendation is to adjust that and to dismantle that a little bit to allow for a more dense configuration, a more sort of you know, walkable area like we talked about with the goals of this project. Um, so for example, um, there's a limit of 33% lot coverage for buildings. Um, we just don't think that that's probably necessary. Let the design of, of what developers are trying to achieve um, guide those choices going forward. Um, reduce the minimum lot size. Right now it's at 18,000. There's no reason it can't be as small as 5,000 square feet. Um, there, are, there are several lots, many lots in there that don't meet the 18,000 square feet already. Um, so reducing that down and again giving folks flexibility in terms of how they subdivide and how they configure their lots I think is, is advisable. And then eliminate the scaling of the lot size for multifamily. So one of the things that Norton and many other communities uh, do is, is they say that, well, we'll allow multifamily, but the more units you add, we want your lot to expand. And so I think the idea with that is they're thinking about impacts to abutters. Um, so if, if in a particular area of the community, you're going to put up a, a 12 unit multifamily or a 16 unit multifamily, the thinking was, well, let's push those lot lines out, move those setbacks out so we're not necessarily impacting the single family or whatever may be on the, on the side. From an, that's all well and good in some places, but from an urban design perspective, you don't want to do that. You don't, it, it is perfectly appropriate and advisable to put you know, the same setbacks between buildings, whether they're one story and sort of a small scale commercial or three story and have 12 units of apartments in them, keep those setbacks the same. You can think of all those different places, traditional village centers that you've been to where all the buildings are different size and they're all kind of packed in together and it's just really easy to walk from one to the next. So you don't want those lot sizes unnecessarily expanding as you go. And this idea, you know, this, this is something that, you know, always causes a, a little bit of confusion going forward is, is how you, reg you regulate this thing called the frontage, what you call the frontage area. And it gets a little confusing because it's not the front yard. It's not the front yard setback. And that's what, the, what zoning boards and planning boards and building officials are used to regulating is saying, well, there's the lot line, there's the right of way line and you need to be back 50 feet from that. And that's all well and good. So that's fine, that works in many different places. In these traditional centers, 
it's important to give a little bit of flexibility because the pedestrian never experiences the lot line. The pedestrian in places all over New England, I see it all the time because I know how to find it in the sidewalk, is you'll see the lot line goes right down the middle of the sidewalk. Nobody knows that, but that's the way it is because that's the way the road was configured years and years ago or that's the way the building was located years and years ago. What the pedestrian wants is a frontage area that works. They want a place where maybe somebody can bike safely, where there's a nice street tree, where there's a place they can walk, a place they can sit, and then there's their building. That's the frontage area. It very well could be in some of these scenarios that the lot line goes right down the middle of some of this. This allows, for example, if the state puts a beautiful six-foot sidewalk right down the edge of the, of the roadway there, this allows the property owner to take credit for that. That's part of their frontage area. So even if the lot line encroaches, they can locate their building in a way that's best for the pedestrian, not necessarily some uh, setback with which they have to comply. Parking, one of my favorites. Um, so changing our approach here, um, this is, this is uh, an issue that is not unique to Norton in any way. We deal with this quite a bit in other communities. Um, I think one of the advantages of starting small with this village center commercial um, is you can do things like this. You can eliminate minimum parking requirements. Uh, right now, you have parking requirements that are sort of typical suburban requirements. And if you look at the way they function, um, four per thousand, five per thousand. When you get into that level of parking requirements, the parking lot is now twice the footprint of a single story building. So when you're thinking about creating a walkable, mixed use, compact area, and now you've surrounded a bunch of single story buildings with all of this required parking, um, you've, you've kind of missed, you, you've missed the opportunity there. Um, so, Everywhere you go that you love, like Chatham, Hyannis, Newburyport, Portsmouth, um, you name it, Easton, downtown Easton, um, all of these places, they don't have enough, they, they theoretically don't have enough parking. Um, but these are our favorite places to go. And so what happens is with this type of approach is you ask the um, applicant for a parking report and he or she has to explain to you how they think they're going to meet their options, it can certainly mean on-site parking. So if the developer is going to put in six units of housing above the, the shop, that developer is going to think very hard and say, am I going to be able to fill these if these people don't have parking? And that answer might be no. So the developer may choose to put in somewhere between six and 12 parking spaces on site. There's no requirement for that. That's a market-based decision that the developer gets to make. Signage, uh, just an example of some of the, I think, the, the, the adjustments that we make to the design standards here. Um, the design standards that you have in place right now, there's a lot of shoulds. Um, so the developer should do this, the developer should do that. Um, but there isn't really a lot of punch to it. And so we've changed a bit of the language um, in the draft that we provided for you. And it's really about, again, thinking about this frontage area, thinking about the perception of the pedestrian in that area. If a pedestrian is in this area on the right with the towering sign, this is clearly an environment that is made for cars. And the pedestrian is on alert and is not necessarily feeling totally safe moving through this area. Small adjustments like the one on the left, um, scaling things down, not making them sort of auto and highway scale, but making them human scale, um, just makes, sends a different signal to folks. And it does make a difference in terms of how these areas um, are, uh, are designed. And we chose these because um, you know, all of your corporations who seem to be very cookie cutter, whether it's McDonald's or CVS or Walgreens or whoever they are, they have all these models. They have them all. You just have to ask for them. They're all in the books. It's, not, it's no great uh, difficulty for them to turn their design book to the next page and say, okay, we've got that there. The types of signage, so some more clear definitions about you know, new technologies and what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. Um, and so it's just a summary 
um, for the zoning, a new small district called the Village Center Core, smaller menu of uses, easier parking and loading, strong focus on the frontage area and more teeth in the design. So in the report, what we, we worked back and forth with Paul and others, um, there's a draft for you to get started. So it's not a proposal. It's not something that, oh my God, you're gonna like, it's gonna be brought to hearing um, in, in like, you know, the next time that you meet. It's a pro proposal for you all to get started with. So you can see how the language plays out and then you can debate it and you can go back and forth and make adjustments to, you know, what you think is appropriate. Um, and I'll stop there. Can I just ask, um, that last slide, the last uh, bullet was more teeth on design. What do you mean by that? So where, where, I, where I said 90% um, of, the, of the design language in the village center district today is should. You should do this. 90% or 80% or whatever the percent is, a much higher percent in the draft that you're going to see is shall. So it's, it's more prescriptive. Um, it doesn't cover everything. We're not talking about architecture. We're not talking about windows. And we're not talking about colors and all those things. But it gets to the core of what needs to work. And that's the relationship of the building to the street, the location of the parking, should you choose to provide it, and then delineating the difference between areas where pedestrians and bicyclists are going to travel and automobiles are going to travel and where they're going to intersect, making sure that that's designed properly. So, you know, when you're talking about design standards and guidelines and zoning, we always talk about sort of three different categories depending on the community. And there's a list of sort of the must-haves. And then there's the maybes, and then there's the, do you really want to go there? Um, and some communities do. Uh, so, but that first one, the must-haves, if you are looking to create a village where people can walk and bike and move around safely, you have to have these sort of core five or six standards. Those are the ones that have teeth. Those are the ones that are shall. And again, you can read what we've written and debate them and make that choice for yourself. It's going to be a hell of an analogy, but I'll use it anyways. Um, and I forget what Supreme Court Justice said. I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's always bothered me about the concept of trying to design a downtown is that what I think uh, you should do as a developer may be different from what Kevin thinks or the developer thinks. Mm -hmm. Yet my sense is that if someone is, someone puts their mind to it as a developer and says, look, this, this community is looking to develop a downtown. If I had no restrictions on the density, parking, whatever else, but I have to prove to these people and show these people that what I want to build as a CVS or as a Walgreens or as a uh, you know, retail center um, is going to appeal to them, then there's an incentive for them to do just that, to, to draw something, to design something, to propose something that in essence knocks a community socks off. So how do you get them motivated? And I, my concern has always been, if you say to the developer, well, you, know, you only need um, you know, one parking space for 1,000 square feet as opposed to the five. If you say to the developer um, that uh, you, know, you um, don't, don't have a frontage requirement or a setback requirement, then they're, they're going to, they're going to play those, 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 um, zoning requirements to their advantage. Whereas if you create, for example, an overlay district that says, this is the underlying zoning. You need five parking spaces for 1,000. You need 25 foot setback. You need whatever else. But you will know, throw all that out the window. If we are impressed by your proposal, uh, we will waive parking requirements t to some extent. And or you know, waive some of these other things doing it as part of an overlay and a special permit so that the onus is on them and my sense is there are some creative people out there that will propose something. Have you ever had that? Uh, have you ever? Yeah, and, 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 you, and you said it correctly, right? So it's um, the first question 
or one of the first questions is by right versus special permit. So if you want to do, if you, if you want to have, say, an overlay or even a base zoning district that has a ton of flexibility to it to do, uh, to, to, to put it in the developer's lap and say, come on, knock our socks off and we'll give you the permit. If you want to do that, you absolutely have to use a special permit. Um, if, if you are going to go the by right route, then you have to be more prescriptive, right? Because the, you have to give the terms of compliance because it's by right as long as they comply with everything that you've put in the zoning. Um, so those are the things that you're weighing. One of the things that comes into play, um, especially if you're going to layer it, right? So say you have the base zoning and you leave the base zoning the way it is today and you put a special permit on top of it and you say, okay, you got the base zoning and in the base zoning you can put in um, a honeydew donuts and you can set it way back and you can give us um, 45 parking spaces and we'll call it a day. Or you can give us a three-story mixed-use building and we want all the bells and whistles um, and it, but it's going to be a special permit. So the developer then has to weigh, all right, I've got the path to certainty and then I've got the risk is th of the special permits because this is discretionary. I can be conditioned, I can go through extended hearings, and I can be denied by law. So the question comes down to market at that point. So yes, there are places that do this. They probably, in my opinion, they probably have stronger markets than Norton does. Um, in terms, of, I think Norton can do the Honeydew Donuts and the Cumberland Farms. They can do that all day long because of the volume of cars that you have go going through there. It's a shoe in It's a layup for the developers. They know that's going to pencil out. Um, on the mixed use side, that there's going to be more to it. So. Again, you guys can all debate this when, when you do it. That approach is totally legal, it's totally viable, and there are precedents for it. In my opinion, I think the market, if you give a choice between what you have out there today and then a discretionary permit um, that kind of puts it in the developer's lap, I, I'm not betting on that second one. I'm not betting you're gonna get that second one. Even if there are density rewards? Uh... Yeah. It would have to be pretty significant of a density reward. Well, in a place like Austin, where I was, yeah. um, the height benefits that developers were looking for to offset, say, for affordable housing, a lot of city council members wouldn't go there because it was just too much. And so they wouldn't take advantage of the, that, the density bonus. Yeah, Sometimes, of, but one of the traps that folks fall into, and I certainly did early in my career before I got schooled by a couple of developers, was this idea that if you just keep adding units, the, the pro form is going to get better. And that doesn't always happen that way. Um, you know, one of the things you got to consider is your market again, how much are you going to be able to demand for rent or for a sale price on a condo um, in this area, and the cost of construction per unit does go way up with multifamily because you're not putting in one or two bathrooms, you're putting in 12, you know, so all of that, all the kitchen and all that stuff, so the cost per unit goes way up as well and that feeds into that equation in a way that's very influential on the back end. Two questions. One, yeah. um, it, obviously we don't have the facilities for, off uh, for street parking mm -hmm. in this area. Have you explored any any areas surrounding this um, this district that perhaps the town owns owns that could be utilized for parking parking er, uh, parking areas as needed parking areas? There, I mean, you have the the school institutions, um, which you know again that's that's a local discussion um, that could be very simple or not. Um, so that, that could be part of it. Um, there's the, the church, there's, uh, there's, the univer there's the college. Um, so there are sort of parking resources in the area and there would have to be discussion around that. Um, I mean, what we find, you know, in areas that have this working well, um, you know, I, I live in a, I guess, I mean, even though I live in the city of Providence, my neighborhood is very suburban, sort of a sort of a dense suburban, and there is no parking in the two-block commercial strip that we have. And these are all sort of one-story, you know, little cute 
pizza places, whatever, that kind of thing. And all these folks valet park. And so the gas station across the street, the parking lot is full all night long because of the, you know, the, the deals that have been made. So the business community does a lot to figure this out. But it's worth noting that the CVS in my neighborhood will not you know, they're like, no, we're not, we're not getting into that game. We don't need to do this. Um, so it's a question of who's going to come to the table and who isn't. Um, so there's a variety of different ways to do it. I think looking for lots um, that you already own or lots that you could buy is a great resource. We did a no parking required um, zone that was, a, that was a total layup in the town of Walpole because there was, they were lucky enough to have a giant municipal parking lot sort of in the back of their Main Street area next to the town offices. Can you ever, does it ever work where you can ask the developer or the owner to participate in the cost of providing that service? It's a little hard to do that in Massachusetts. The, uh, we, have, we have some pretty antiquated zoning laws, so this idea of sort of a fee in lieu, you're going to pay into a parking fund. Um, I, think, I think the city of Newburyport may have successfully done that. And I heard it was like negotiating, you know, world peace, basically, <laughs> to, to try to get that done. One other thing, in one of the, the, the uses you had there, um, you exclude single family, and I understand multiple family, but I was just qu questioning a duplex, a two-family house in, in this area. Does that take away from our ability? It's not a big area, having a two-family house as opposed to facilitating some kind of retail use. I think that's a valid question. I think it's a valid question. I mean, I, you know, we're we're looking to provide different housing types and different housing choices. And if that lot does get down to 5,000 square feet, a two-family home may be the best use for that. But I don't. Th I I think that's a valid question. Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to add? J just one thing. I guess maybe on the opposite end of where what Joe was asking about, where I've seen where uh, standards are so rigid that you know, it was an example of an airport reuse in Austin where they had to get a hundred, literally a hundred variances <laughs> to it because it was so strict. I think, you know, Nate and the team did a great job of offering, uh, you know, flexible options. It's not zero, you know, a bill to line to five feet. It's not that strict. So I think they've given us a good, a good place to, to not just to start, but really advance the ball that I, I think there's, there's a lot of flexibility in it. The envelope isn't just like this. It can, things can move around. But mm -hmm. the overall intent is to create a more walkable uh, pedestrian environment, more compact, bringing buildings closer together, and trying to bring them up a couple stories as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we've, we've reviewed it. Uh, Chris Carmichael also looked at it, because you'll find in, in that exhibit it's toward the back of Exhibit A, um, is a you know a draft of of this new zoning district, which um, we certainly want to start moving, getting going forward, especially now with the sewer work going on there. I'd rather, I would just recommend getting ahead of this on the zoning, and I would agree with that, Paul. try to have, <coughs> and I, <I'm coughs> in, in doing the site work. Have you identified what's there now in terms of the likelihood of them being encouraged to make changes or some of the, like a CVS that's not changing for you? Right. you know, I don't know how many other facilities. I mean, you know it as well as I do. There's, there's, there's a handful of buildings out there that look ripe yeah. for reinvestments. And then there's new construction out there. There's sort of brand new sparkling pharmacies. Um, they're not going to go anywhere soon. Um, but. Maybe we could just get them to change their sign, Orin. <laughs> <laughs> bring them Maybe down a little. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> I think we had, as a member of the committee, with lots of discussions about who is what all those buildings are, who is in them now, what they're thinking. Wheaton was a very active participant mm. in all of this, so I think we collected a lot of things. And Bob, I think you'll agree we looked at a lot of different things. Yeah, I was going to ask Mr. Kimball if you if you wanted to come up and speak as well. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not what it is. Being past my bedtime. So the, um, I mean, obviously, this whole concept, the village concept idea, is to, in my opinion, the main concern is the uh, 
F-rated intersection we have here in the town of Norton. And it's not just the town of Norton, it's a more of a regional issue, not just, not just here. So uh, we looked at a lot of different options, but getting back to the parking is one example. You know, if we end up having to take land to the right of the church, that opens up a lot of green space, which opens up a lot of possibility for additional space for parking, for bus stops or whatever, you know, whatever use we might have. The, uh, by bisecting the, uh, the, uh, the town common, we call it the town common. It's not really the town common, but we call it that. It is um, allowing some green space to the right by the old library where we could put additional parking if we needed it. But the whole report is to give you guys some direction on what we think the town, the direction the town needs to go. And you've all talked about it. We've got sewage coming in. You know, we've got a, a failing intersection. We've got all these, all these issues coming up real fast. And yeah, it may take 8, 10, 12, 20 years to do it. But if we don't get started on it now, think about what, that, what this village center could look like in five years and how much land we're going to have to take. And by the way, this is going to cost the town some money. This is not a gift. We're not going to just go out there and say to the state uh, that you're going to come in Mass Highway, you're going to come in and you're going to do this. No, it's not how it works. If every, everyone here is aware of the uh, project, we just, we're getting ready to just start on, on East Main Street. We had to come up with the money for the engineering design. We had to come up with all that money to make it happen. We have to take land. The state does not take, by eminent domain, does not take land. So if we decide to take the buildings to the right of the church, whatever it might, we may design, uh, we have to buy that. The town has to buy it. So the town's going to have to step up and come up with some cash. And that may be the hardest part of the whole project, whether or not or how we're going to do it. But I think first and foremost, we have to develop the village center core. I think that's important. And the planning board, board of selectmen, town meeting have to decide which of these concepts they think is the most feasible for us, and we have to get going on it. And if we don't start, it's going to be thrown on a, on a, on a bookshelf somewhere. In 10 years from now, we'll still be saying, hopefully cars are flying by then, but if not, we'll be saying, what are we going to do about this? This is a regional problem, and it shouldn't be just bore upon the town of Norton. We should be going out to our state reps, senators, congressmen, whoever they are, and saying, this is not Norton's problem. This is a regional problem. And we need your help and assistance. And I think we can build it faster if we, if we use that approach. If we sit back and just let things go molly go along like they always do, like East, like East Main Street, which has now taken us, it was a five-year project. I think we're probably in the year seven or eight now. You know, it, it takes forever. And if we don't take the time to do it, the concept is great. These guys have done a great job of, of developing this whole plan and stuff to us to take it from here. They're done. Now it's our turn. And we have to figure out how we want to do this. So I would encourage you to, to follow the advice of the zoning issues, the zoning changes, the uh, village center core. You know, we think that's very important to get this thing all started. Wheaton College was very involved in this. Uh, they're very interested in what's going to happen here. For obvious reasons, they're the biggest landowner we have in town in this area. So they want to make sure we, uh, we do it do it right. Um, we don't own any land in, in the center to speak of. We do own a piece of land uh, behind the grid, behind the uh, uh, Trent Memorial. We own that piece out there. It's a combination of where the old water tank used to be is water department land. We have DPW land in the back and we have the COA in the front. It's really the only viable land we own, the town owns in the center, other than what Matt alluded to with, with the schools. The schools have, obviously have some land there, but there really is nothing else we own that we can use, so. But uh, I just wanted to mention the fact that I think they did a great job, and I, I applaud them for, for everything they've done, but now folks, it's our turn. We have to decide what we're gonna do, so. I would encourage you guys to take the lead and get this thing rolling and use your planner. You know, Paul's been very much involved. He knows exactly what, what the thoughts of the committee were and make, that, make this thing move forward. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Matt. Does anybody else have any other comments? No. Sure.
Yeah. If you're, okay. If you're ready. To that. To that. To that. And to, to Bob's wise advice, hopefully, I make a motion that the planning board has reviewed the Norton Village Center plan dated June 11th. We find the plan provides a viable path forward and commit to working with staff, Paul, towards this implementation. We also recognize this plan will be a valuable resource for the upcoming update to the master plan. Much needed, right, Paul? And it's already been shared with the planners at SERPID. I therefore make a motion that the board officially endorse this plan and consider it to be part of our working plan forward. So it's really an endorsement, not an adoption, but an endorsement of what Horsley Witten has put together with their partners and a, a, a start for us to move forward in, in implementation. I'm sorry, which plan are you referring to? The Village Center plan. Which one is that? The, oh, this. This. This program or yes. a particular yeah. plan? This. The, no, oh, this. Not, Presentation oh, oh, okay. and the, the report. report. That goes with okay, that we're, report we're that goes expecting with a particular plan. Yeah, okay. no, the report that goes with this. Okay. So we have a motion that I'm not going to attempt to repeat. Um, <laughs> do we have a second? For a second. Oh. So just Motions. clarification: what Orrin mentioned, we're not endorsing a plan. We're basically not a particular we're, we're one. accepting the presentation in the study. Yes. Allegedly. Yeah. yeah. It's well. It's, it, the, it's written as an endorsement, but not an, an adept, uh, an adoption of a plan. We endorse it. So there's, a, there, there's this. The vision plan. Yeah, this, um, that, right. So this presentation is, is a summary of that plan, and the motion is to endorse that plan. Okay. okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consider it endorsed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Now we just have to f get the game plan, bringing it, continuing it forward. Yeah. So we have a, a couple planning board items to get through. Minutes. Hopefully quickly, because I have to be somewhere. Um, did everyone get a chance to review the June 4th and the April 16th minutes? Uh, yeah. Um, this one go back to clarification we're not adopting the the, uh, the zoning package as it's presented no no, no. we're just no. endorsing no. the whole no. okay just just to be clear <laughs> um, we get to tear it apart and decide what we actually want so do we have <laughs> do we have any changes to we'll start with the april 16th minutes any corrections um yeah uh, um okay um, yeah well, the special town meeting, we have maintained current text and put in the, the following where appropriate. We have what we've actually did. Do we have an attachment oh. to what that following is? No. We do need that. Yeah. Add, I mean, okay. Maybe so we'll just take a markup of what we did and attach it to the minutes or something? Yeah. So should we... Those are April minutes, though. We got to get them approved. If we're attaching the, I assume we have a copy of what was submitted to town meeting. Yeah, yeah. It could be the uh, the report. Can that be added as an attachment? Um, I'm okay with that if, if folks are. So that's obviously the result of the motion. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that. Okay. So is there a motion to approve these minutes with that attachment? One other comment in, in checking with Amy. I don't think we, we, we need to, we, we should be referencing the uh, Norton Media website um, with, with meeting, uh, with the meeting as a part of our records. I think we do have to put something in writing and I don't know if we can at least take that out. And I think she indicated we should be having votes on the findings. We don't have them here, but at least a reference to incorporate in the web page, I don't think is appropriate for, for the minutes. That's under mm -hmm. Farallon Farm. It was kind of in her training that she gave us today. Yeah. yeah. So we can remove that. Yeah. We'll also need to vote on this. There's only five yeah. members. Why not just attach the draft decision to the minutes rather than making for more detail? Yeah. Uh, should say direct on plan to review draft decision attached here too. Yep. Okay. We have that. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, any further corrections or changes? So I guess the motion would be to approve these with the draft decision attached as well as the uh, the actual changes from town meeting. Proposed at town meeting. Proposed at town meeting. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstained. Abstained. Two abstentions. Two abstentions. Two abstentions. Okay. Who, sorry, who abstained? The two people who were, ah, who were not there. That's right. Uh, and I have. Who there in spirit? Uh, for the June 4th minutes. So we're on the June 4th minutes. I have a correction on the backside. Uh, for the motion to continue, it was not through the next meeting because we're not no. talking about it today. Oh, yeah, it was to the oh, 16th. 20, the 16th. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was my only change. I have a couple of edits. Um, on the crash count, we asked for the crash count for the Taunton and the Mansfield Avenue. Um, Where are you looking? The first thing under first, first bullet. bullet. Oh. They gave us traffic counts, but they didn't include Taunton and Mansfield Avenue. And then I'm not sure what this is supposed to say. Does Q go from west to site? I'm not, we asked for the Qs affecting the, the site, the traffic Qs. I don't know what does. Does the we asked them does from it the back west up to reach we, the site? We, yeah. yeah. We asked them to the provide wrong. the cues, the traffic cues right. affecting the site. Yeah, the question right. was if it if it backed up to the well, back toward both the ways. school. There's cues going both ways as it affects the site. Yeah, I think the issue was affecting the schools. Are you saying expand it yeah, in well, both I, directions? I asked for them because we, it goes back the other way to the traffic light. Oh, yeah. The traffic light's going to okay. back things up on both directions. It was best. So we'll add uh, the 140 intersection as well. Um, then uh, down where it says cost of moving the tanks, uh, the question I asked, the cost of removing the tanks. So removing instead of moving. Right. Okay. Oh. And then I thought Joe had asked about the, this, the, uh, the height of the proposed sign, reducing the height of the proposed sign. I had Joe had concerns with with it, right? And then I think Julie, you mentioned matching up the building with uh, across the street. Yeah, I, I I had talked about trying to align driveways. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention whatever what, what language did you want to put in there? Just aligning driveways. Yeah, yeah, just to, to look at the access points and 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 those up and down that corridor to potentially align driveways so there'd be at least direct eyesight across like if you're if you're two drivers you know looking if you look at each other it's much better than if you're offset trying to guess who's going to go first you know what i mean or which happens a lot in, in our community unfortunately there's no Great. real kind of straight t intersections everything's kind of slightly jogged one way or another yeah. and that yeah. causes and issues that blind spots too yeah okay. and then i asked them to uh, uh, indicate whether there's any any issues with the the senior center and the uh, limitations they may have relative to driving and particularly taking left-hand turns. <clears throat> Any further corrections or additions? Yeah, just a quick... Uh editorial uh, typo um, about on the front it says what governs the of gas pumps I think that could be the number of gas pumps oh of yeah I thought I fixed probably the number of yeah yeah probably missing just the hashtag yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. literally just wrote that <laughs> yeah, <me too. laughs> one, of, one other thing it says applicant and peer reviewer to meet which is fine but we we expect the applicant to go back and incorporate all of the peer review comments and suggestions into their next discussion. So I don't know if we need to stipulate that in the notes at all or not. But yeah. I could just say an address comment. Add 
and, and address comments, maybe, yeah. Yeah, as you said. Okay. Does someone want to list out the changes with a, a motion? I, I have them, so okay. uh, if you want. But you want it as a motion? As uh, a, as well, a we have to approve them. So yeah, the, the member would have to make the, the motion to approve with the changes that Paul would list. Does that make sense? Yeah, if, if you if you go through them, Paul, somebody will just yeah. So you do you want to just go through them, yeah. make sure we got them all, and then we can. All right. So the amendments are as follows: uh, under the board questions and concerns, crash count for Taunton and Mansfield Avenue. Go down. Does Q go from um, west to the site as well as one for the 140 intersection to the site? Well, that does. They don't. Have, they didn't provide any. They, they, we asked them to provide the Q. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And what governs the number of gas pumps, cost of removing tanks, the applicant and peer reviewer to meet and address comments, uh, a couple new bullets, or three new bullets, height of uh, the signs, aligned driveways across the street, concerns with the senior center, uh, uh, taking left-hand turns, and then uh, the motion was to continue to the July 16th meeting. Move to accept the minutes as, as revised. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We have one last item here. Um, bills. Lots of bills. Yeah, we have a lot of bills. But there's Do you one want to explain item. this? Yeah. yeah um, as you all changed your organization, uh, new, new, member, new uh, chair, vice chair, and so forth. Um, I need to have you all agree to have give Steve and Tim the authorization to actually sign for the payments. Uh, are they, is, is the accounting office asking, because this should, it should go with the position. It should be planning board approves or authorizes the chairman, whoever that is, yeah. to, um, to you know, sign bills once approved by the the board uh, is is has that discussion been had? Accounting was asking for it. Yeah, he, he accounting wants, wants us to he sign wants up on a, it. A specific name. Right. I, they, they, basically, what you're saying is correct. They just want to ensure that Steve is the chair, and this is acknowledging that. Because the minutes just won't do, apparently. So we'd have to do this yearly. Potentially, if, as you change it. It, if the change were to authorize, I, I hereby move that uh, Steve be authorized to sign bills, and in his absence, the vice chairman, who is um, Tim. They're also asking to authorize uh, the town manager, Mike Units, to uh, sign payroll and timesheets on behalf of the board. So for yeah, so that's uh, we just added that to it. I just yeah, just made that addition to my motion. Okay. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have to abstain? It will abstain. Okay, I'll abstain just in case. All right, the, the rest of us say yes. We, so, so we're not approving the fact that we can sign bills. No, but every, we all have to sign this. So. Um, and we have a bunch of bills. End of the year, end of the fiscal year. Are they any different so than get that was money on, so online? Uh, I think the Nicole added a couple but they're largely, uh, there's a peer, well, Steve, I, if you want to go over it or not. What is it? Do you want? Oh, these? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can, you, do you want to go through them really quick? Sure. All right. Yeah, they have to do with the, yeah, you can. Sure. Well, um, I'll just go through this. But um, we'll, we'll go through them and just pass them down so you can all take a look. Uh, one is for three hundred and fifty-four dollars. It's a peer review uh, for Horsley Witten for the Blue Star Building Seven. So that's actually finishing up that project because there's only ninety-three dollars in the account after this. So um, the next one is a. Um, you just saw Nate's presentation. Uh, there's actually two bills for. Uh, for Horsley Witten regarding the Village Center. Um, 
and this is actually now completing their work um, what happens with those is we will be asking for reimbursement from the state there was a $45,000 grant that we had received uh, this will be the end of that so they've completed their work so um, we have a handful of administrative things WB Mason ordering uh, office supplies we've also or we also recently ordered two 33 inch monitors because the ones I couldn't read plans on a 23 inch so they're now <laughs> dual monitors plus the uh, uh, the supporting rack for yeah, it okay. so And we go you're through gonna do a better job, Paul. Is what you're telling us. I, I, I <laughs> probably can't do our worst job. So it has helped a lot, and it, having a dual monitor again is Huge. really nice. Yeah, Big but difference. seeing it, uh, you know, I was literally using the large rollouts and writing on it. But it's, you know, it's just part of a plan I have to get us digital. You know, uh, my hope is that eventually there will be tablets down here that we don't have to print off hard copies for you and other board members that we can just use this to connect to you know uh, whether it's our online permitting or for Dropbox which we're still trying to purchase we haven't forgotten um, there's a funny story behind that but before we get to that um, we have a peer review for John Chessia who is reviewing the uh, Cumberland Farms so he was doing the stormwater. I, I have not yet received uh, for the uh, Vanessa and Associates for their work. Um, we have signs by tomorrow, which did some laminated of our of the updated zoning maps. Uh, the Sun Chronicle uh, for uh, some outstanding uh, advertisement we had regarding town meetings. They didn't charge us twice, right? Paul, when we, they botched up that, the no, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, they uh, they can't charge us for something they didn't do. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then, and um, then, oh, for Amazon. Oh, well, Am I'm sorry. Amazon was where we had the uh, computer monitors and the, the stands. Yeah. Right. You need this. That's yeah. And then I'll do he did something. All right. Motion to approve all the bills as uh, noted. Second. Uh, motion and a second. Any discussion on them? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Okay. I think that's all we have tonight. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. <laughs> I, nobody's seconding this. I know. <laughs> Who's seconding?